Uh, so as promised, we have clicker questions today. And they actually start counting as of today. So let's actually start them. If it actually will start, maybe I need to start over here. Uh, where do we go? There we go. Uh, equilibrium constant of a chemical reaction is mathematically related to the rate constants of the reaction, the concentration of the products and reactants, the standard free energy of the reaction, and Stedman's favorites, A and B, or A, B, and C. And remember, please feel free to chat to your neighbors. This is not closed book. It's not closed people. So you have one more minute. OK, what do people think? Interesting distribution we have here. So equilibrium constant of a chemical reaction is mathematically related to rate constants, concentration of products and reactants, standard free energy of the reaction, or A and B and A, B, and C. It's going to be pretty much divided between B and D. So A and B, or <coughs> excuse me, just B alone. Uh, I guess I didn't do a good job of explaining this, because the answer is actually E. <laughs> and the reason for that is, again, hopefully that was from the last lecture. Now, clearly, it's important rate constants. It's just the ratio of the rate constants is what your equilibrium constant is. Concentration of products and reactants, that's going to determine what that actual final equilibrium constant is. Then the standard free energy of the reaction that was that exponential relationship that we talked about, why it's so important to know about the equilibrium constant and your gives you the Gibbs free energy of those reactions. And so these are <coughs> important um, things to know. And I guess I didn't do a good enough job of emphasizing that. And it, you can go back and check. It's on YouTube. It's there. So our next question. The presence of an enzyme changes what aspect of a reaction? The overall energy change of the reaction, whether a reaction is spontaneous or not, the rates of reaction, the equilibrium constant, or A and B. OK, so either I did a better job of explaining this, or your chemistry instructors did. 
Uh, <laughs> so um, presence of the enzyme has nothing to do with overall energy changes, which, is, of course, determines whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. It has everything to do with the rates of reaction. And we just talked about the equilibrium constant being relative to the, now it's not the rate constants, the rate constants are the same. It's the rate which changes when you have enzymes, which are actually around. So um, yes, we all agree on this one. At least most of us agree, which is good. I like that. Um, for some reason, I thought I had three questions, but I guess not today. So uh, we'll start now by reviewing what we talked about last time. Again, basically, what I need you to know, or want you anyway to know, about chemical reactions. We just talked about in terms of chemical kinetics. Um, basic message here, of course, is that you can get stimulation of rates with enzyme reactions, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today, is how those enzymes work. Talk a little bit about protein structure, um, particularly in terms of, of course, primary structure being that linear stretch of amino acids, secondary structure, which is where you have hydrogen bonding between backbone atoms, that's the amide and carboxy groups that you have on your peptide backbone. Those interact to form basically alpha helices, beta sheets, and to some extent beta turns. You can put some of those secondary structures together. You end up with motifs. Once you have multiple motifs, or at least part of a protein that forms a regular three-dimensional structure, that's your domain. And that, of course, having a regular three-dimensional structure is likely to have a particular function. Um, most proteins have multiple domains that get put together to make a single protein, but some proteins are just a single domain. So that doesn't, one doesn't necessarily rule the other one out. Protein folding, again, we talked about chaperones um, last time. Basically, all that chaperones are doing is blocking those kinds of interactions that you have that you shouldn't have. Again, you know, my preteen daughters, the interactions they shouldn't be having here. And of course, now I found where that clicker question was. I put it out of order. And so here it is. Um, so we can start again with that. I know you just put your clickers away. Now you have to take them back out. Sorry about that. I won't start until people have an extra second or two to get going here. So our third question is, Primary protein structure is formed by hydrogen bonds, van der Waals interactions, ionic interactions, peptide bonds, or A, B, and C. Okay, hopefully by now you figured out who you want to sit next to <laughs> for the rest of the class. Um, again, I'm either doing a decent job or other people whose classes you've taken have done a decent job on this one. So yes, it is the peptide bonds, of course, which are forming your primary structure, because all that primary structure is, is how those amino acids are linked up to each other. So we're going to talk about today are just finishing up with folding talk briefly about some enzymes which are actually involved in folding. And these are enzymes which are literally acting on the protein itself. We talked a little bit about the heat shock proteins, the HSP70s, the HSP90s, the HSP60s. Those have enzymatic activity, 
because they hydrolyze ATP, but that just changes the structure of the chaperone itself. It doesn't change the structure of the actual protein that's being folded. These two enzymes we're going to talk about today, protein disulfide isomerase and the one that I messed up last time, peptidylprolyl cis trans isomerase. Uh, these actually are changing the structure of the particular substrate, that protein which is being folded during that process. Then we'll talk about enzymes and ligands. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about dissociation constants before. Spend some time talking about the enzymes specifically in terms of how they work and then the regulation of some of those enzymes. So let's start out talking about disulfides. Disulfides, as we mentioned before, it's one of those special amino acids, the ones that you have down at the bottom of all of the tables. These are cysteines which have sulfhydryl groups present on them. If two cysteines are close enough to each other in the structure or even part of the folding process under oxidizing conditions, then you can form a disulfide bond between these two cysteine residues. And that holds together either two different polypeptides here, or much more commonly, actually, you have them being held together here in the same polypeptide chain. So interchain and intrachain disulfide bonds. What does the isomerase do? Well, basically, it shifts these bonds around. It will break one of these disulfides and reform another one. And this is really important because if you've got the improper disulfide bond, what a disulfide bond is, this is a covalent linkage, it's really going to constrain the structure that you can have on one particular part of your protein. And if you've got multiple cysteines, so here this particular protein, hypothetical one, has four cysteines. In the appropriate disulfides, you've got 8 to 14 and 10 to 3, which have disulfide bonds. But the sulfhydryl groups have no idea. They don't know which one they're actually attached to. So this one or that one. So the protein disulfide isomerase just lowers the activation energy of this interaction between the two. That's the first of the enzymes. The second of the enzymes is this unpronounceable peptidylprolysis isomerase. Yes, question in the back. Oh, so yeah, the question, I'm trying to try to repeat these two, um, is, is it that lowering of the activation energy that makes it a correct interaction? No, it's actually really quite like what happens with the chaperones. Is it will, you know, again, it's, it's like going to be a stability issue. If the rest of the protein is in its most stable state, usually then you'll have the proper disulfide bonds. Um, but it's, it's just at that particular reaction, it's just a reaction. And so it makes no difference. It, it can't tell whether it's a correct or an incorrect disulfide bond, per se. It has to do with the stability of the whole protein. Okay, other questions on disulfide isomerase? No, okay. So peptidoprolose cis-trans isomerase. Uh, I spend about three years of my life actually working on this protein. So near and dear, and I still can't pronounce it, which is really annoying. Um, but the message here is that with Prolines, they have this very bizarre side chain because it doesn't hang out here like other side chains. It loops around and hooks back up to the peptide chain. And so in that process, it gives you two possibilities. You can either have the peptide bond now in a trans configuration or in a cis configuration around where this proline is. This isomerization actually happens really quite fast in the absence of any kind of enzyme. But as we mentioned last time, inside the cell, you're not at a very dilute, pure protein kinds of concentrations. You've got very high protein concentrations, and very often it's lots of other proteins which are in there. The protein which is being made off of the ribosome may or may not be in the correct formation to actually get proper protein folding. And so this enzyme, it turns out, is actually really important for getting the proteins to fold properly at the right speed. 
you know, they'll fold properly eventually, but this just speeds up that process. Again, it's changing the rates, which is what happens with these enzymes. If you think about it, what kinds of proteins is this going to be the most important for? Those that have lots of prolines in them. And the classic example of this is collagen, which is the most common protein in our bodies and our cells. And so you really need these peptidoprolysis transisomerases to get the appropriate folding of collagen. Collagen is a structural protein, so it's really important to have exactly the correct structure. So that's what that is happening. Why do we care so much about protein folding? Well, it turns out that a lot of currently pretty prevalent and probably becoming more prevalent diseases have to do with protein folding. And this is just a relatively short list here. We now know genetically, particularly for early onset cases of things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that these are proteins that are involved in getting appropriate protein folding. Um, so they're <clears throat> ubiquitin ligases in this case. We'll talk about ubiquitin ligases. We talk about regulation in just a second here. Uh, these are proteins which get improperly folded, and those are then forming plaques, which are what you see in Alzheimer's patients and to some extent in Parkinson's disease, et cetera. Huntington's disease down here at the bottom. Huntington is a really quite well-known protein. Uh, turns out that the number of one particular residue, in the case of Huntington, it's a glutamine residue. Um, if you have too many of these, this protein misfolds, and you have a horrid neurodegenerative disease a little bit older than you are when you are about my age. So um, nothing we can do about it at this point. So questions on protein folding before we move on to ligands and binding. Again, why we do the whole folding process in the first place. Okay, so just quick definition. Ligand is anything that a protein binds to. So it can be DNA, it can be another protein, it can be a small molecule, you name it. If that protein happens to be an enzyme, these are now going to be substrates for that enzyme or, in some cases, of course, products because you have that reaction which is actually taking place. Ligands, in many cases, the binding of the ligand to the protein will cause a change in the structure of the protein. It's not always the case, but it's most of the time that you have this um, which is taking place. So how do you interact? How does the protein interact with these ligands? Well, there's two real sort of binding processes which are happening here. One is specificity, and that specificity, the concept here is that that is determining which of the thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands, of different possible ligands which are present in the cell actually bind to that protein. So it's really deciding which molecule it's actually going to interact with. Affinity is how tightly those things interact with each other. So there are different things, hopefully um, different concepts. Uh, the book talks about antibodies and antigens which I didn't think is a great example, but I what the textbook used, so I wanted to go through it a little bit. Uh, antibodies, um, this, want to know more about that. Anybody taking immunology, by the way? Some of you have taken immunology. I highly recommend it. It's a great course. Actually, you're supposed to have taken this course first before you take that one. So it's one of the reasonings here. Uh, because immunology is really based on protein-ligand interactions and how you make those particular proteins and how you make those particular ligands. So 10 weeks to find out more about that. But as far as we're concerned, the important thing here is that ligand-protein interaction, the ligand-protein interaction happens here. It's what's called the variable region of the antibodies. And here's our you know, antigen binding site or where you're getting these particular interactions. Antibodies are nice examples of multi-domain proteins and also quaternary structure because they have multiple polypeptides that come together. You've got heavy chains and light chains. You've got two heavy chains, two light chains. Um, each of these interacts with each other and they interact with a ligand here. This is the classic way that people usually draw these two heavy chains, two light chains, with this extremely variable region 
up here. How that variable region forms is totally cool and way beyond the scope of this course. Uh, once you have these variable domains, it turns out that they're particularly good at binding to antigens. And that binding happens through molecular complementarity, like we talked about last time. So there are lots and lots of non-covalent, weak bond interactions, and really very much a people call lock and key. So almost complementary structures to each other, how these two things interact with each other. So that's general. Let's talk about enzymes in more detail. We already looked at enzymes, and I just asked you a clicker question about enzymes. This is true for any catalyzed reaction, but in biological systems, that catalyst is almost always going to be an enzyme. What does it do? Basically lowers the activation energy. So that lowering of activation energy, how can you do that? Multiple different ways. Stabilize your transition state. Almost all reactions are going to go through some kind of transition state. So if you can stabilize that transition state, usually these are highly unstable states chemically. You can stabilize that. You can greatly increase the rate of reaction, which is relative to lowering that activation energy. Straining bonds, basically bending it, not quite ready to break, also is a very good way that you can stimulate chemical activity. Just bringing the two substrates together is sometimes enough to get that. And if you think about entropy, a big part of your free energy, well, these things are very close to each other. That means that you don't have to worry so much about entropic issues. You can sometimes even form covalent bonds to substrates. We'll see that in terms of the serine proteases we'll talk about in just a second. Um, very often, these are involved in acid-base catalysis. They're taking on, putting off protons, et cetera. <clears throat> what does that? Well, it's interesting. We've got all these you know, wonderful catalysts. And enzymes are some of the best catalysts that are actually out there. They can stimulate rates by 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th. Uh, but what actually does that is usually very few amino acids. And so a lot of people joke and say that, OK, well, you know, all this protein structure, all these you know, extra amino acids, et cetera, they're all basically just scaffolding to hold three or four amino acids in exactly the right place. And so you've got incredibly inefficient in terms of catalysis, in terms of making these proteins. And it's a great example of how evolution is good enough and not necessarily an optimal solution to things. Again, example right here. If we look at lysozyme, probably one of the best studied enzymes, a lot of it done just down the road in Corvallis and Eugene. Uh, you look at the structure of lysozyme, basically you only really need four amino acids to get lysozyme to work, but the whole lysozyme protein is almost 130 amino acids in length. What you have to do is have those four amino acids, and particularly those four amino acid side chains, in exactly the right orientation. And so that's what's called the active site, because that's where all of your enzymatic activity takes place. So all the protein folding that happens with lysozyme is to get these four amino acids into exactly the right place. And that's potentially why it's also really hard to figure out protein folding, because it's mostly all this extra scaffolding stuff and the actual individual amino acids that you need for your activity are very few relative to everything else which is there. The example that's used in our textbook is the trypsin enzyme. Again, has an active site here. What's interesting about trypsin, which is a little different from some other enzymes, including lysozyme, is that it has a separate catalytic site and binding site. And so this is now depending on where your enzyme activity is taking place. That's taking place in your catalytic site, and your binding pocket is slightly separate from that. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail in just a second, but I wanted to mention some of the general cases for enzymes. There's really sort of two models. One is this lock and key interaction. And all I say with lock and key interactions is a lot like antibody-antigen interactions. These are completely complementary surfaces, even separate from each other. So if you look at the structure of one molecule, look at the structure of the other molecule, this one is going to fit that molecule really nicely. On the other hand, you also have these induced fits, which is basically where, again, you have a, a fist and a flat piece. 
And so these come together, now you have a nice interaction. But there's no specific interaction. That structure in the absence of the ligand is different than the structure in the presence of the ligand. So these are two different models. Both actually are really quite well known in terms of enzymes. Again, what does the enzyme do? We've talked about this already, but wanted to emphasize this a little bit more. If you just look at the rates of your reaction, and again, that's what enzymes do. They increase rates of reaction. If you look at increasing amounts of substrate, just depends on the amount of enzyme that you have. Lower amounts of enzyme down here in the blue line, more enzyme that you have up here in the red line. That now is going to determine how fast your reaction can go. However, this amount of enzyme doesn't change the overall equilibrium of the reaction. Again, we just talked about that. And an indication of that is the affinity, or the KM here, which you also think a little bit like an equilibrium constant. It's not changing relative to the enzyme concentration here. The half maximal is going to be your KM here. That's half of this maximum. Half of the maximum rate is the KM. It's the same value down here. If, of course, you change substrates, that KM is now going to change, because different substrates are going to have different affinities for each other. And if you look at the affinity, if you have higher affinity, again, you're going to be binding better. That's going to speed up your reaction more. You look here on the red line down at the bottom. Here, your reaction is sped up more than in this case. However, the final rate here doesn't change. It's just two different substrates. Faster initial rates that we have here. You can do some of the math. And I think this is the last equation we're going to have in this class. Yay? We happy? Good? No, we can't care? We haven't had enough coffee yet this morning? OK. Um, so <clears throat> Michaelis and Menton um, looked at this particular very general reaction of enzymes reacting with each other. So an enzyme plus substrate, this is just an interaction which takes place. And you know, A plus B goes to AB. This you know, very regular, what you would call, you know, we already looked at this as an equilibrium constant. Here, it's the KM. It's just this association step. So that's sort of the first part of your enzyme catalyzed reaction. The second part is now going from this substrate to product. The rate constant for that is known as the catalytic rate constant. You can rearrange all of these things relative to each other, looking at reaction rates. Okay, what's your reaction rate? It's just the change in the product concentration over time. That's related to your maximum velocity, this Km and substrate concentrations, or relative to the Kcat. These are all numbers that you can measure. The initial enzyme concentration, your binding constant, how much substrate you start with, and your catalytic efficiency. So this is the so-called Michaelis-Menten equation. But these are all things that you can measure. And you can learn a lot about enzymes through this. Most people will talk about your KM or your affinity for your particular substrate. Also talk about the Kcat. And one thing that I didn't put on here, it's also not in the textbook, but it's used a lot in the literature. It's what's called enzymatic efficiency. And that's Kcat over Km. So a lot of times you talk to biochemists, they'll talk about enzymatic efficiency. Well, it's just the Kcat over Km. Talked about enzyme catalyzed reactions before. Basically, all that you're doing is lowering this transition state intermediate between your substrate and your product. But that's a drastic oversimplification. Usually in these enzyme reactions, you have, again, these two steps. It's not just a one-step reaction. There are two because of the enzyme involved. So enzyme plus substrate goes to an enzyme substrate intermediate. There's a change in that enzyme substrate intermediate, which then leads to enzyme plus product. But this overall difference in delta G here is much less than that 
overall difference that you had here in your uncatalyzed reaction. Now, here, this is still a spontaneous reaction because the product has lower energy in the substrate, but the rates in an uncatalyzed state are going to be ridiculously low. You'll never really see much in the way of product. Whereas, in this case, you start to see some of that. So let's look at one particular example, and if you want to know more about enzyme catalysis, I strongly recommend taking biochemistry. If you do take biochemistry, take the 400 level course. I know some of you don't have the time to do that, but way better than the 300 level course. So substrate binding. So first step, you have to go from E plus S to your ES complex. In the case of serine proteases, there are two things that go on. The binding you have to your substrate, substrate in these proteases. It's an ACE, so it's an enzyme. What does it work on? Proteins, so it binds to proteins. And true for a lot of these enzymes, it breaks them. So that binding process here really has two parts. One is binding to the peptide backbone. Here, there's a beta strand in your enzyme, which is in blue, and the substrate is here in black. And then you get your specificity, because all backbones are the same. They've all got their same residues on them. It's that side chain which is going to give you your specificity. In these serine proteases, it's a so-called binding pocket. And that's a specific structure that forms, again, in your three-dimensional protein. And in this particular case, it binds really well to arginine because it's a deep pocket. Arginine is a long side chain. And it has a nice negatively charged aspartate at the bottom of that binding pocket. So negative charges, what do they want to interact with? Positive charges, long positive charges. We now have our arginine side chain at the bottom here. Not surprisingly, this will also bind to what amino acid? Lysine, yes, also will bind to lysine. Lysine has a slightly different length chain here, so it doesn't bind as well, but you do get some binding to lysine here. So you'll end up with this protease cleaving most of the time next to arginine, but in some cases also next to lysine. So these are the two binding sites. Trypsin, which is the one that we're looking at here, binds again next to arginines and lysines. There's a chymotrypsin, which has an almost identical structure, and we looked at that last time. It was the one that was 30% identical between the two different structures. One of the differences is that this is a serine at the bottom of the binding pocket as opposed to an aspartate. And because that is a serine down here, you no longer have charge interactions, and that's going to take nice large side chains, and particularly side chains that are either hydrophobic or those that are going to interact with your OH down here at the bottom. So large polar or nonpolar side chains. And elastase, which also has an extremely similar structure, has a couple of valines right in the middle of this binding pocket. This is going to be much smaller binding pocket and highly hydrophobic. So now these are going to interact with these proteins that have short hydrophobic side chains at this particular position. Right next to that is where we have our enzymatic activity. It's the catalytic site. This catalytic site could care less what's going on over here. It's going to be the same in all of these different enzymes and has exactly the same functionality. So let's take a look at that mechanism. You have enzyme substrate complexes. There's a specific serine. That's why it's called a serine protease, which is sitting in the catalytic site has an OH, serines have OHs, right next to our friend histidine. Now, why is histidine so important? Again, we're... So histidine's a nucleophile, which is true, but much more importantly, it has to do with the pKa of histidine. You remember, at neutral pH and near neutral pH, you can either be protonated or not protonated. And we'll see that this is true for this particular class of enzymes, and again, if you take more biochemistry, you'll see it's true for many, many different um, classes of enzymes. So under the appropriate pH conditions, this now <clears throat> will be ionized. It picks up this hydrogen 
from the serine that allows a covalent bond to form between the serine and your peptide. This is a highly unstable intermediate, but it's forming a covalent bond. Once you have this interaction together, now you have hydrolysis, addition of water, which causes this first cleavage of the peptide bond to take place, but you're still bound to the enzyme. Then there's a rearrangement that takes place between this water, which is now going to become part of that peptide chain which is lost. Now we get removed here. If you'll notice this EP complex right here is identical to the ES complex. Just this is about to be removed. So this is a cycle, and there should be an arrow that goes around here, where you have attack by the serine, critically dependent on the ionization of the histidine, covalent interactions, water comes in, cleaves this, and you return again. And again, so this is that histidine, low pH, it's not active, it's active at high pH, and this is all relative to that particular site. So any questions on this particular aspect of enzymatic activity? Again, if you want to learn more, take 490, 491, 492 in that other department that will remain nameless. Okay, so let's talk about how we can regulate that enzyme activity. It turns out that if all enzymes were active all the time, we'd have all kinds of problems, partly because a lot of the enzymes have this kind of activity that we just talked about, proteolytic. So if you're breaking down all the proteins all the time, then we're going to have problems in terms of actually having those proteins function on what they're supposed to be doing. So you can regulate enzyme activity by amount of enzyme, and we'll spend a lot more time talking about how you make, through transcription and translation, enzymes later on. But also, we just talked about the pH. So, particular pH, enzymes will be active or non-active, and in the case of those serine proteases, has to do with the ionization of that one particular histidine. Temperature is also very important, and temperature, if you think about temperature, all that is is molecular motion. So depending on how flexible your protein is, how flexible that active site is, how flexible your substrate is, it's going to change the activity of the enzyme. Assembly, many of these enzymes, and we'll see some examples as we move on today, have multiple different pieces that have to come together in order to actually have enzymatic function. And then probably most regulation of enzyme activity has to do with enzyme inhibitors. And so these are other ligands that are going to interact with that particular enzyme. Very often, those other ligands will cause an allosteric effect. It's a change in the structure. We have a change in the structure. We have a change in function, yes. Uh, and then many cases, and this is a particular favorite case of my colleague who teaches the other section of molecular biology, Dr. Singer, post-translational modifications. So post-translational modifications are also very important for regulating the activity of enzymes and proteins and all kinds of other different things. Let's look at a couple of those examples. First is temperature dependence. Temperature dependence is something near and dear to me because I work with thermophiles. These are organisms that optimally function at much higher temperature than we function at. My favorite organism is Sulfalobus sulfatericus, again, model archaeal organism grows up at 80 degrees Celsius. We're at 80 degrees Celsius, we've got problems. They're at 80 degrees Celsius, they're perfectly happy. One of the things that makes them perfectly happy is that their enzymes are actually really very stable at these high temperatures and have optimal activities at these high temperatures. But if you were to lower them to the you know, poor cold temperature of, say, the lab bench or inside us, their enzymes have practically no activity. And so you have these optimal of different activities for these different enzymes, usually just about the optimum temperature for that particular organism. pH dependence we already talked about. This is the example from the textbook. Chymotrypsin we just talked about, optimal activity around neutrality, just about what you have inside most cells. A lysosomal enzyme, 
It's present in the lysosome at much lower pH. That's really nothing relative to some of these enzymes. Pepsin is a great example. This is now an enzyme which turns out as an extremely similar structure and function to those serine proteases that we just talked about, but it's functioning in the gut, mammalian gut at very low pH, um, pH of 1 to 2. And so that optimal activity is at that particular pH. And now how do you do that? Again, similar kinds of activities. You're going to have to be protonated or not protonated different residues in the active site. You also then have to have other residues around them leading to a local pH effect, the local pKa being maybe not just exactly neutrality as you would have for something like trypsin or chymotrypsin that we just talked about. So it's that specific structure, what you have in the catalytic site, all of those side chains, which are going to determine the pH dependence of that particular reaction. Oligomerization state also can lead to whether you have function or not. Here, for instance, we'll have an active site that is between two different polypeptides. A and B don't interact with each other very well. A and C don't interact with each other very well. But A and D do. And it turns out that your active site is right between these two individual polypeptides. And we'll see this later on. And again, if you do more biochemistry, you'll see that very often active sites are actually between two polypeptides. And so you have to bring those two polypeptides together in order to form exactly the right constellation of amino acid side chains to get your both binding specificity and activity. One of the favorite examples, again, of my colleague Dr. Singer is this one right here. This is a ubiquitin ligase complex. All of these different colors here represent different polypeptides. You only have activity if all of these different polypeptides come together. So in this case, one, purple, two, three, four, five different proteins that have to come together to get this particular activity. Here, this is the ligand, which is being bound to by this ubiquitin ligase complex. We'll look at what this is doing um, in just a second here. Many of these guys function again together with each other. Why is that? Well, one is regulation, because you can bring those proteins together, and it's only when those proteins are brought together that you actually have activity. But also, even if you have multiple different enzymes, which are shown here as A, B, and C, it's advantageous to the cell to have these proteins very close to each other. And the reason for that is diffusion. Most of these substrates for your enzymes are small molecules. They're going to be moving around inside the cell. The shorter distance they actually have to move before they can be bound by the next enzyme is going to speed up the rate of your overall reaction. We talked about almost all reactions on biology are coupled reactions. So there are multiple different reactions that are all bound to each other. See, linked to each other, I should say. Bound, if you can get all the enzymes that are associated with each other, then you can have much more efficient reactions. So if each of these enzymes is free in solution, it's the least efficient. If they're bound to each other with non-covalent interactions, or in many cases there's a scaffolding protein, so a particular protein that these enzymes will now bind to, that gives you more efficient, or in many cases, and it seems that this is an evolutionary process, in organisms that have to do all of these reactions at the same time extremely efficiently, extremely efficiently, excuse me, these are all bound together in one particular polypeptide because you can't get any closer than actually covalently linked to each of these different molecules. It's a great example of the antibiotic production, which takes place in many microorganisms. And this is also studied in the chemistry department in the lab of Dr. Reynolds. Um, many of these proteins that undergo very complex reactions are all hooked together as one big polypeptide. So you can regulate by bringing things together, you can regulate by amounts, but probably most enzymes, and how we understand most enzymes, most of the regulation takes place through interactions with other ligands. Two different 
ways here. This is called inhibitor binding, but it could just as easily be stimulator binding, where you have an enzyme with a particular active site, shown here as sort of a part of a square or a nice right angle. This would normally bind a substrate, and you would have product formation. But if you have an inhibitor, which has a similar binding specificity, but very different rest of its molecule, so for instance, in terms of a, a protease, this would not have a peptide that's associated with it. So here, binds to the active site. Not surprisingly, once this inhibitor is bound to the active site, it can't bind to substrate anymore. So these are what's called competitive inhibition. If you look at reaction curves, enzyme stimulation, you can tell whether it's a competitive or a non-competitive inhibitor. Many cases, you'll have an inhibitor which will bind to your enzyme not in the active site, but that active binding will change the structure of the enzyme, that induced fit that I was talking about before. You have interaction with an inhibitor and your enzyme changes the active site. If you've changed the active site, of course, you can't bind to substrate anymore. So these are classic example of what people call allosteri. The allosteri is that you have ligand binding to your protein, which changes the structure. Nice examples of that that we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes are guanosine, triphosphate, and calcium. Allosteri means that you have binding in one place. It causes a change in the structure in some other place in your protein. Now, how can this actually take place? Well, it's because these proteins have these three-dimensional structures. And so they're going to have side chains interacting with each other. One part of the protein, you change the structure here, it's going to bend or realign other parts of your structure in the rest of the protein. These can be both positive or negative in terms of changing the activity of a particular enzyme. We just looked at the inhibitors. Those would be the cases that we have for the negative cases. But you also have so-called allosteric activators. And so they'll bind to one part of your protein, cause a change, for instance, maybe open up the active site. So you can actually interact with that. Let's look at a pictorial way of looking at this right now. Here's inhibition, basically exactly the same thing that we looked at before. Slightly different cartoon. Here we have our allosteric binding site in the so-called regulatory subunit, or very often you'll talk about regulatory subunits and catalytic subunits. So here we have allosteric <coughs> binding by this little T-shaped molecule. Once you have binding by that T-shaped molecule, it changes the active site here. I don't like this diagram too much, but the idea is it's supposed to sexually shrunken this active site in such a way your substrate can no longer interact with it. So this cutout from the pi is larger than this cutout from the pi over here. On the other hand, if you have an allosteric activator, again, a regulatory subunit and a catalytic subunit, the activator binds to your regulatory subunit and now opens up your active site such that the substrate can bind and now you can have catalytic activity. So allosteri, this is a very simple way of looking at it, happens all throughout the biological universe. You have multiple different ligands interacting with proteins, causing structural changes to take place. One nice example of this is calcium binding. This is the calmodulin protein. Once it binds to calcium, which are these green balls here, you can see a huge change in the structure. This is unbound at the top here, bound down at the bottom. So binding of these molecules, which is quite a long way away from what its actually standard ligand is, causes that structural change in order to give you the actual output of this particular, in this case it's a signaling protein. This Calmodulin is used in many different places, but nerve cells and muscle cells are probably the best understood of those. So we've got allosteric modulation, we've got amounts, we've got pH, we've got temperature, we've got association, but then 
that last way that we can change the activity of proteins, and particularly enzymes, is through covalent interactions. So the probably best understood of these, and most common, is phosphorylation. And all that this is, is it takes a phosphate group and puts it onto a side chain OH that you have on your protein. So here, this process, <clears throat> putting the phosphate on, protein kinase, where does that phosphate come from? Our friend ATP, it's the gamma phosphate. Protein kinase has the target protein as a substrate, ATP as a substrate, now adds a phosphate to it. Phosphate is wonderful for probably two really important reasons. One, of course, is these negative charges. So you've gone now from a polar side chain, an OH that can form hydrogen bonds, to this pretty bulky, which is the other aspect of things, and highly negatively charged thing on the outside of your protein. If you think about how you want to change structure? Well, one way to do that, big, highly charged. That's almost always now going to be changing whatever kind of interactions that particular protein is going to have with other ligands. So regulation here, put on the phosphate. Once you've put it on, you're also going to want to take it off again. These are now the protein phosphatases. And so this is just a cycle, and a lot of people think about these as being a switch. So protein kinase phosphorylate, this is turned on, the phosphatase will turn it off. So just flip-flop. Now there are some cases where non-phosphorylated is active, but usually phosphorylated is an active form and dephosphorylated is an inactive form. Look at some more examples of this. There are many, many, many kinases and phosphatases. If you think about a yeast cell, there are more than 500 kinases and phosphatases in about 6,000 proteins that you have in any given yeast cell. That's a very high percentage of what you actually have in that yeast cell. And the same thing is true for larger eukaryotes as well. The other thing with phosphorylation is that it's a really fast way to change activity. So you think about temperature, you think about pH, you think about amount of protein. Doing all these things takes a lot of time. You're know, making protein. You've got to transcribe a gene, you've got to translate it, you've got to fold the protein. If you want to change the, how you could change the temperature of an enzyme reaction, what's well, kind of tough to do, particularly if you're a warm-blooded organism like we are. So um, these are things where you can change the activity extremely fast. Um, so again, just a switch process is another way of looking at it right here. This particular case is a serine side chain. All of the phosphorylation in eukaryotic cells that we know of takes place on serine, threonine, and tyrosine, because those are the three amino acids with OHs at the end. Those have been listening really carefully. Notice that I mentioned eukaryotic. Turns out that some bacteria can phosphorylate in other places as well. So again, this is a switch. Kinase phosphorylates. It's on phosphorylase turns it off. And again, in some cases, when you're phosphorylated, you're off. And when you're not phosphorylated, you're on. So it's just a switch, back and forth. What are these again? They're serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And again, these are those three side chains, OH, OH, OH. And these will become really important in cell biology because it turns out that particularly for signaling and in the cell cycle, phosphorylation is really, really critical. There's another, people also call it a switch. I don't like this more as a switch. I think it's more as a timer. But basically, it's serving the same role here, only it's not a covalent modification. It's an enzymatic activity which causes a change in the structure. So, these are what are called the G proteins or GTPases. Here you have a GTPase bound to GTP. What does it do? It cleaves that terminal phosphate and gives you GDP. This is now an inactive state, and then you can activate it by binding GTP again. Um, 
But why I like to think of this as a timer is that once you're bound to GTP and you're in this active state, it's only going to stay active for a short period of time because this enzymatic activity. GTP is going to go to GDP. Now you can regulate this process in two different ways. One is by changing the rate of this enzymatic hydrolysis or by activating the process by getting more GTP binding. So if you look at this in another cartoon form over here on the right hand side, we have our signal that comes into the system, usually would be the cell. If you think about classic G proteins, this literally is a signal coming in from the outside of the cell because they're usually bound to the membrane of the cell. That signal comes in. Now you have this guanosine nucleotide exchange factor. All this is the activator, which puts in GTP. Now you have an active form of your GTPase. The signal goes away, or just a certain period of time, you have this hydrolysis that takes place. You go back over here. If you have a guanosine nucleotide activating protein, and not, sorry, guanosine nucleotidase activating protein, or a GAP protein, people always say GAP, um, that stimulates this hydrolysis effect. So you have these exchange factors or GTPase activating proteins. Let's look at one example of that, probably the best known of the GTPases. It's the soap protein called RAS. Why do people care about RAS? Either most common or second most common protein mutated in solid tumors. So critical protein in terms of tumor development. It's a GTPase. Here's a structure of that protein bound to GTP. It's a relatively small protein. When it's bound to GTP, it has a particular conformation that leads to other signals which lead to cellular proliferation, which is why it's an issue in terms of cancer cells. You have GTP hydrolysis. You remove this last phosphate. What happens? This helix and the end of this strand come together and now you have an inactive form of RAS that is not going to be telling the cell to proliferate. Now, why is a switch so important here? Well, once you tell a cell to proliferate, you don't want it to con proliferate continuously, right? Unless it happens to be a cancer cell. So what happens in a lot of the mutations that happen in RAS in tumors is that this is now frozen in the on state, even when bound to GDP. So that's the case here for the RAS proteins and how they're interacting <clears throat> with that. So the last five minutes or so, I'd like to talk a little bit about the last step in terms of modifying protein activity, particularly enzyme activity, and that has to do with breaking down proteins, getting rid of them. So that has to do with the proteasome, Proteasome, I like to think of as the cellular garbage disposal. Takes all of the proteins that you don't want anymore, chews them up into little bits. And one example of that would be the misfolded proteins that we talked about when we talked about protein folding last time. Any unfolded protein should get sent to the proteasome and cleaved up into individual nucleotides. If that doesn't happen, then sometimes you can get some of these diseases that are diseases of protein folding, like I talked about a couple minutes ago, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera. So this process is really critical. What happens here? Here is that garbage disposal itself. It's the proteasome right here, so-called 20S proteasome. This is basically a whole bunch of proteases, and proteases that will bind to pretty much every amino acid side chain and chew them up. Well, this is great if you want to get rid of the proteins, but you're only going to want to get rid of certain proteins. So to get into this molecular garbage disposal, you need to go down the drain, which is sort of what these cap structures are like. Now, to get to these cap structures, you need to have a particular signal attached to your protein that says, I like to think this is the eat me signal. 
saying, hey, you know, this is a protein that is not supposed to be around anymore. We need to get rid of this protein. What is that signal? That signal is ubiquitin. And we, you know, took it in a ubiquitin ligase. We talked about multimeric proteins just a second ago. How do you put ubiquitin onto a protein? There are three proteins that are involved, E1, E2, and E3. E1 is a so-called ubiquitin activating enzyme. It takes ubiquitin and makes it into an active form. Now, surprise, surprise, we already talked about these activated precursors, activated precursors for reactions. True for small molecules, ubiquitin is a protein. You also activate ubiquitin. E2 is the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, and basically all that it does is it switches this activated ubiquitin onto an E2 protein, and sometimes you get many, many ubiquitins that are added to that. Then the really most critical part of this whole process is the ubiquitin ligase protein, or the E3 protein. This is what gives you specificity. This is what binds to the protein, puts the ubiquitin onto it, and says, hey, this is the one that needs to be degraded. This is the one that needs to be eaten up. So you have attachment of ubiquitin to this target protein. That attachment is through a peptide bond. Well, that's bizarre. How do you form peptide bonds? other than at the N or C terminus of any particular protein. Well, it does that where you have these <clears throat> NH2 side chains. Where do you have NH2 side chains? Which amino acids? It's getting late. We all want to go home. <laughs> lysines. So the, but particularly lys, uh, lysines. So lysines, you end up with this polyubiquitin chain. That then leads you into the proteasome. This is what that looks like in a little bit more detail. Here is that process. Here you have our ubiquitin. It's each of these red lollipops attached to, in this case, it's the N-terminus, but usually it's a side chain lysine. That then leads this protein to bind to the sink, which then will lead it, excuse me, into the garbage disposal, which will cleave everything up here. So it's now 10.05. We'll talk more about that sync process and how you put that polypeptide into the proteasome on Wednesday.